Okay, so let's move on to the secondary sexual characteristics. These are the non-reproductive traits that signal physical maturity to other observers. So if we look back at our see-through naked people, we'll notice that for women, the or girls at puberty, the big addition is going to be laying down of fat around the breasts. And of course the memory tissues swell and things like that at puberty and then the fat gets deposited. Um, for the widening of the hips, which is a universal sign of fertility, most of that is due to laying down of fat on the hips and thighs. Um, there's a really interesting article about the function of the fat that's laid down on the hips and thighs, that women who have that kind of fat have children whose IQs are slightly higher than women who have less of that fat on their the hips and thighs. So one thought is that that fat contains the kind of lipoproteins that are really necessary for brain development in a fetus. So it's possible that one of the reasons why men worldwide find a waist that's narrower than the hips attractive is because they you know, unconsciously are aware that that's a sign of fertility and a, a potentially healthy offspring. Anyway, a little digression. So fat gets laid down on the breasts and on the hips and that's um, the main change that's going to happen to women. For women, the absence of testosterone tends to keep the face looking relatively youthful. So there isn't a huge change in women's physical features between childhood and adolescence and into adulthood. It isn't until later adulthood when women stop having so much estrogen that they, we see different facial changes. Um, for males, the addition of testosterone triggers a bunch of changes. So physically in the body, the most notable change will be that the uh, shoulders are going to widen compared to the hips. Um, and that's a big change that happens early in adolescence and can be kind of surprising for adolescent boys when they discover that their shoulders are starting to run into things. You know, they thought they'd fit through that space and then they hit the lamp with their shoulder or something. Um, so the shoulders widen relative to the hips. The um, addition of testosterone makes uh, the subcutaneous fat that had been present prior to puberty start to um, reduce and then muscle mass start to increase. Now that can take years and years for the completion of that. And so for, for boys, the onset of puberty somewhere around, your know, growth spurt will happen somewhere around 12, um, probably into their 20s before they start to have this exchange of um, body fat for muscle mass. Um, the, the widening shoulders probably you're going to see somewhere around age 15, something like that on average. Uh, other changes that happen, the voice is going to drop. Actually that's one of the one of the early changes is the voice dropping and there's a period of time when um, in the process of the voice changing he can actually end up sounding more like his mom for a while than his dad and then his voice will completely change. Uh, the larynx gets bigger, what we call the Adam's apple, gets bigger in response to testosterone. And then he's going to start to develop facial hair. And again, that's going to be towards the end of adolescence. At the end, towards the end of puberty will be the um, beard growth pattern. For both sexes, there will be the addition of underarm hair and pubic hair, um, which is a sign of uh, maturation. And you saw in those pictures before that it's a very um, prescribed pattern of the addition of, of pubic hair. It's pretty interesting how it, it comes out in a pretty typical pattern for everybody. Ending in a different kind of pattern for males than um, for females. Kind of interesting. Um, the jaw gets heavier but in males, but again this takes a lot of time. So as the muscle mass is building, the jaw will actually widen and become heavier. So there, there's a lot of stuff that we could be talking about with males that change as a function of testosterone, whereas there's only a couple of things that the addition of, te of estrogen does to women. It's um, the deposition of fat pr predominantly that's going to happen for women that's you know, going to be easily distinguishable across a room that this woman is mature versus that is a little girl. That man is mature, that's a little boy. Okay, let's get back to sexual behavior. So in adolescence, you know, a lot of times we have our first crush somewhere around our growth spurt, maybe a little before that, we start to have our first crushes. Um, you know, and I love this picture because it would, if it wasn't meant to hurt, they wouldn't call it a crush, right? Um, a lot of times these early crushes are on people that you don't really know. 
it's either like a famous person or it's a it's a peer who runs in a different crowd than you do and so you ide you idealize them you assume that they would share your opinions you assume that you would have similar interests you assume that you would get along really well and that if he only knew that he that you loved him he'd love you back or she or whatever um, What's interesting about early crushes is that sometimes we have these feelings towards somebody who's the same sex when later on in our lives we're going to be heterosexual or it's somebody of the other sex and later on in our lives we're going to be homosexual. It might be relatives. Uh, I hope my nieces don't hear this when I say this, but when I was dating my husband in high school, um, his nieces were, you know, in this age bracket. And I think they were a little miffed when we got married because I think they were going to marry Uncle Pat, you know, because he was the cutest and the coolest and all that, right? And, and so, of course, they were going to marry Uncle Pat, right? And it's like, kind of, they were a little, they tried to reject me. They tried to push me and get me away from him and all sorts of stuff because I think he was theirs, even though, you know, he's their uncle. I actually have that exact same story starring my uncle who, um, there are just so many problems with me having a crush on my uncle, right? Because he's my uncle. He was gay. It's like, there's just so much wrong with this story. But, you know, I was going to marry Uncle Bill, right? Why would I not marry Uncle Bill? Um, masturbation in adolescence. Now, we have, I'm going to have a lot of data that I'm going to provide you that comes out of the National Survey of Sexual Health and Behavior from 2010. There hasn't been a new publication of this basic, same basic survey recently. In fact, I heard um, a discussion um, between commentators about whether 14 to 17 year olds should be polled about these kinds of questions because you know they're delicate and we shouldn't be asking them these things and you know if their parents only knew and, and that sort of stuff so it might be getting harder and harder to pull 14 to 17 year olds going forward as people are getting um, up in arms about it but uh, what they found in the most recent one is that 74 percent of the males and 48 percent of the females reported that they masturbate We've talked about masturbation rates and, and reporting of it and things like that before. So we're just, I'm reiterating that, you know, from birth, we're seeing all along higher rates among the males and the females, whether it's an, uh, an observer reporting it or it's people reporting it for themselves. Um, oral sex. The majority of teenagers approve of oral sex, again, coming from the um, National Survey of Sexual Health and Behavior. Um, here we have rates of males and females reporting that they had performed oral sex or they had received oral sex. And you'll see that more girls report that they have performed oral sex, more men, more males, re girl, what would they be called, guys, um, report that they have received oral sex. So um, it looks like fellatio is the most common um, type of oral sex going on among teenagers in this survey. Most teenagers report that they that it's a safe alternative to coitus. And as we have discussed before, you can catch STIs. You can't you can't get pregnant. I will grant them that. You can't get pregnant from oral sex. But I don't think teenagers appropriately realize that they can catch STIs through oral sex. Um, they do maintain their vaginal virginity, I guess. Um, they will not get pregnant, that's true, but then they incorrectly believe that they'll avoid exposing themselves to STIs. So that's unfortunate that they've got that misunderstanding. Um, coitus. The average age for first intercourse for boys is almost 17, and for girls it's just over 17. Um, it's kind of interesting how closely tied the average age of first intercourse has stayed to um, you know, driving age. Um, as we've started to have laws where, um, yeah, you can get your license at 16, but you can't drive with unrelated, you know, peers until you've ha been driving for six months and things like that, different things around the country. We've seen the age of first intercourse go up. I don't know if that's correlated or, I mean, if it's um, causal or just correlated. Um, we also have seen an, uh, an increase in the age of first intercourse since the 80s as, um, you know, kids have been, um, you know, using other behaviors and other things and waiting on first intercourse. Um, so here we have a depiction of, this is what's called a cumulative percentage. So the males are in the light bars, 
or the light line and the uh, females are in the darker line and so we start at the age of 15 and everybody boys and girls about a quarter of them report having had their first coitus um, and then we're going up over time and, and you'll see that the number keeps accumulating so by 16 40 percent of girls and just a little bit less than that of boys say that they've had first intercourse and going forward you really see a disparity at 18 where 70 percent of girls and just over 60 percent of boys report that they've had first intercourse keep going the girls are still ahead through 19 and then when we get up to 20 to 21 the boys are a little bit ahead and you know we could probably infer that some of those 20 to 20 year old boys are probably having sex with some of those 18 to 19 year old girls right and so um, we have an age disparity where when you're talking about the 15 year old boys and girls having the same rates those 15 year old boys are probably not necessarily having sex with those 15 year old girls so probably you know because um, the age disparity is a really common thing in sexual behavior boys tend to be a little bit older than the girls they're having sex with um, and then by the time we get to 22 to 24 we're back to um, it looks like the girls are a little higher but the stati they're statistically the same so by 22 to 24 almost everybody has had first first coitus but not everybody and it's really a very common misunderstanding teenagers think that by 18 almost everybody's had sex when in fact if you look at by 18 um, you know it's two-thirds 70 percent of people who have had first intercourse so a lot of kids you know adolescents are waiting for first intercourse a lot longer than I think their peers think they are you know there's a lot of rumor innuendo and stuff like that when we're in school um, which speaking of school brings up the issue of sex education you know this is a political football that gets passed back and forth and back and forth and you know whoever's in power at the moment tries their method and um, so we've had opportunities to collect data on which methods seem to work there are really two basic approaches to sex education in adolescence on the left I've got the comprehensive method it's oftentimes referred to as abstinence plus and then on the right hand side we have abstinence only both of them promote abstinence from sex try and encourage kids to delay onset of sexual activity um, under the comprehensive plus in addition to promoting abstinence they also acknowledge that teenagers have a high probability of becoming sexually sexually active and as a result they say it's really important to use contraception um, ideally have two forms of contraception one being a condom to protect from STIs as much as you can and something else you really reduce your probability of becoming pregnant they do discuss abortion how it's performed you know the the time limits on it and things like that and they um, discuss ways to practice safer sex to reduce the transmission of STIs and H HIV in particular so there's a lot more going on in the abstinence plus method a lot of people who are pro sex education um, say well comprehensive I mean you have to do that I mean kids are going to become sexually active you need to give them the tools that they need um, to prevent pregnancy and STIs and it makes I mean it sounds logical right the problem with kids with teenagers is that they understand the data they understand conceptually they understand the risks all that stuff they can totally pass tests on it they understand they get it but where everything just goes out the window is in the heat of the moment when they're not thinking clearly and so um, when we look at the impacts of abstinence only programs on the number of sexual programs so uh, partners so here this first chart I have for you is the red is kids who were trained using an abstinence only program versus the control group which were kids who weren't in a formal abstinence only program we don't know where they got their um, sex ed if any and what you see is it absolutely abstinence only does not change any outcome in any way shape or form relative to the control group um, so that's not promising right um, here we have again we're comparing abstinence only school 
uh, students to those in the control group, and this is the number of um, times that they had unprotected sex, in the, or, or what percentage of them had had unprotected sex in the last year. And again, absolutely no difference between groups. Um, and so a lot of people look at that, these two pieces of data, and they say, well, see, absence only doesn't do anything. That's assuming the control group didn't have any kind of health, uh, any kind of um, training either, which is kind of hard to have these days. Kids who haven't learned something about sex from some source, right? Let's stay on absence only, though, for a second. There are different types of abstinence education in different states' laws. So in the blue, they, are, they follow a process called abstinence-stressed, in the gray, they follow abstinence is promoted. Um, blue, abstinence is covered. And then in the white ones, no abstinence provision in their laws at all. Now, during the time that these abstinence emphases have been in place, we've actually seen a drop in pregnancy rate and drop in abortion rate. So it was 1993 when the federal government declared that if you want federal funding for your school, and you teach sex ed at all, it has to be abstinence only sex ed. So starting in 1993, abstinence only was unrolled. Now, not all schools did it. Some states said, fine, we won't take the federal funding because we think comprehensive sex education is so important. So some states didn't worry about it and they continued to teach this, the, the subject matter the way that they want it. Other schools couldn't afford to do that. Other states couldn't afford to do that. And so they followed the abstinence only protocol. Um, it doesn't really matter if you look since 1993 is when we've seen this decline in pre pregnancy rates and in abortion rates. So some people have pointed to that and said, look how well abstinence only works. Look at the drop in the pregnancy and the abortion rates. And look at the increase in the average age of first sexual intercourse that we've seen in the same time period. Well, again, we have to be really careful about correlations versus causation because there is a correlation between the onset of abstinence only and the decrease in pregnancy and abortion. But there's other stuff that was going on at the same time. This was 1993 when they instituted abstinence only, and part of the reason why they instituted it was in reaction to HIV, which in 1993 was this mysterious, going to kill you, you better not have sex kind of disease. They really literally didn't know what else to do. Um, so we start teaching abstinence only also at a time when people were really scared about sex and we're reducing the number of the partners that they were having anyway and we're delaying onset of sexual activity anyway so we're not sure that abstinence only did it or if the context did it let's talk a little bit about what these different terms mean stressed um, abstinence only is stressed so like this is what Louisiana follows and what they say is that basically the major emphasis of any sex education and instruction offered in the public schools must be to encourage abstinence between unmarried persons and so they have to uh, emphasize um, abstinence from sex if you're not married emphasize that abstinence is the only way to prevent pregnancy and STDs um, and that each student has the power to control their behavior and to use reasoning, self-esteem, and respect for others as reasons to delay onset of sexual activity. In the promoted category, which is what Washington State follows, um, any curriculum and material, I, I used Colorado's language though because it was easier to find, um, any curriculum and materials developed and used in teaching sexuality and human reproduction must include values and responsibility and will give primary emphasis to abstinence by school-aged children. Now you see that term school-aged children and you might be picturing you know sixth graders but they're talking about anybody who's still of an age to be in the K through 12 system and that's the policy that uh, Washington basically follows uh, the covered which would be the teal states or the green states where the color is um, like Oregon says that course instruction shall promote abstinence for school-aged youth and mutually monogamous relationships with an uninfected partner for adults as the safest and most responsible sexual behavior. However, abstinence shall not be taught to the exclusion of other material and instruction. Um, so in the covered, they say, yeah, you should talk about it, but there are other things we could be talking about too, like contraception and, you know, safe sex and stuff like that. So different states have different approaches. Um, the thing, I, I thought I had a picture of the, um, let me go back to this one. If 
if we were to substitute students and abstinence programs in the in the red bar and students in the comprehensive programs in the in the blue bars this graph would still look exactly the same it turns out it really fundamentally does not matter which method of sex education children are provided with um, it really there are so many other things other factors that go into determining whether a child stayed abstinent or not or if they used a condom when they did have sex or if they became pregnant while they were under insert some age here um, type of sex education is only one factor that might possibly perhaps have an effect on children's um, decision-making process with regard to sex okay so let's go ahead and take a break and we'll come back and talk about condom use in the next section